Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, welcome to this UN Food System Summit pre-summit affiliated session organized by UN Nutrition entitled Putting Nutrition at the Center of Food Systems Transformation. I'm Nancy Aborto and I'm the Deputy Director of the Food and Nutrition Division of the FAO and I'm a member of the Steering Committee of UN Nutrition. And it is my honor and my privilege to be the moderator of today's session. With so many sessions and events happening this week for you to choose from, we are so pleased that you've chosen to spend some time with us here today. A few notes for the smooth running of this virtual event. Firstly, if you have any trouble, if you can't hear me so well or see me so well, we just actually suggest you shut down Zoom and try joining again. You'd be surprised how often that'll fix your problem. But if you continue to encounter any difficulties, don't worry. Please note that we are indeed recording this session and we will make the recording available after the event. This is a webinar of approximately 50 minutes and we appreciate your engagement throughout. So I invite you at any time during today's session to please use the question and answer function to pose any questions you have to anyone you hear from today. And I also invite you to put comments or conversation pieces into the chat. So in that regard, actually, as we get started, we'd be happy to see you say hello and let us know where you are joining us from. But without any further ado, to get us started, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nayoko Yamamoto, the Chair of the UN Nutrition and the Assistant Director General of the Universal Health Coverage and Healthier Populations Division of the World Health Organization. Dr. Yamamoto, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nancy, Your Excellency, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this session on putting nutrition at the center of food system transformation organized by UN Nutrition, the United Nations Common Voice for Nutrition. This is a critical year to strongly embed nutrition in the action and coalitions proposed at this food system summit but also as the climate and the biodiversity hopes and to present strongly commitment at the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit in December this year. Even before COVID-19 crisis, the world was not on track to achieve SDG 2 on ending hunger. The pandemic has made this significantly more challenging. The 2021 State of Food Security and Nutrition Report the SOFI estimated that 660 million people may still face hunger in 2030. This is 30 million more than if the pandemic had not happened. Access to safe food and good nutrition is a human right. UN Nutrition strongly calls on all actors to recognize that addressing all forms of malnutrition is a powerful labor to transforming toward more sustainable food systems. This starts with the human rights approach and emphasizes the importance of sustainable, healthy diets. It needs good governance at all levels and solutions that fit the environmental and local context. Strong coalition with include nutrition are being built, for example, on school meals and child wasting. But more emphasis is needed on where the importance of the nutrition cut across all action tracks. So far, around half of the solution clusters appear to embed nutrition. In this event, we want to throw, we want to show how UN leaders is relying focus on the nutrition so that no one is left behind, whoever they are and wherever, whoever they are and wherever they are. I'm really honored to be joined today by such an esteemed panel speakers to reiterate our commitments to place people at the heart of food system transformation with our Royal Highness Princess Sarah of Jordan giving us a final call for action. Let me stop here and, and ha happy to hand over to moderator Nancy and Deputy Director of the Food, uh, food and Nutrition Division of PAO and the member of the UN Nutrition core steering committee. So thank you very much um, to join this year. Now I would like to hand over to Nancy. Thank you. Over to you. 
Thank you, Naoko. You really helped us set the stage for today's event and reminded us again that we're in this unique moment in 2021 with this Food System Summit, the Nutrition for Growth Summit. It's a moment for us to advance nutrition and through events like today, we can pull together our collective voice and put forward those collaborative efforts that are essential for putting nutrition at the center of food systems, for eliminating hunger and reaching our goals, not only SDG2, but across all of the SDGs. So in that context, it is indeed an enormous pleasure to be here moderating as a member of the steering committee of UN Nutrition. UN Nutrition, we have member agencies and partners from FAO, EFAD, UNEP, UNICEF, UN Habitat, UNIDO, WFP, WHO, and really many, many more. And we're all rallying for that food systems transformation at all levels. And we're cognizant that the stakes are very high, that the time is now. So with that in mind, let's hear our keynote address from one of the world's most renowned advocates for nutrition for our most precious stakeholders, our children. Of course, I'm speaking about Ms. Henrietta Ford, the executive director of UNICEF and the chair of the Sun Lead Group. That's the Scaling Up Nutrition Lead Group. ED4 is joining us today with video remarks, and I now invite, please, my colleagues to share her address with us. On behalf of everyone at UNICEF, thank you, friends, colleagues, and partners from around the world. Together, we are putting nutrition at the heart of food systems transformation. Today's meeting is an important step towards the UN Food Systems Summit later this year. Like you, UNICEF is convinced that food systems play a vital role in ensuring good nutrition for people around the world, especially children. The people, policies, and processes that underpin food systems are critical, but in too many instances, they are also failing the very people they seek to serve. Too often, they are driven by profit over purpose. Decisions about how food is processed, packaged, and promoted fail to put the best interests of children and the planet first. This places the most nutritious food out of reach for millions of households, forcing them to rely on cheaper but also unhealthier and less sustainable food instead. This failure translates into stunting and wasting, overweight and obesity, and deficiencies in vitamins and micronutrients. Conflicts, environmental crises, and health emergencies are also putting food systems at risk. Famines loom in multiple countries. Growing poverty caused by the COVID-19 pandemic is shrinking incomes. At the same time, industrial food production contributes one-third of greenhouse gas emissions globally, and its heavy use of fresh water, fertilizers, and pesticides has an immense ecological impact. The good news is that positive change is possible and is happening at scale. Since 2000, the world has reduced the prevalence of children under five suffering from stunting by one-third and the number of children with stunting by 55 million. But we are also clear-eyed about the challenges ahead. One in three children under five is not growing well because of malnutrition, and two in three are not getting the minimum diverse diets they need to grow, learn, and develop to their full potential. September Summit is a chance to turn this around and identify solutions that can deliver progress at scale. Solutions like subsidies that reduce the price of healthy foods like fruits and vegetables, mandatory fortification of staple foods with micronutrients, food labeling that is clear and easy to understand, and reducing sodium, sugar, and trans fats in processed foods. We also call on governments to strengthen policies and enforce legislation and regulations to protect children from marketing practices that promote unhealthy foods and beverages, and to invest in public information and education around healthy foods and diets so parents can make the right decisions for their children. This meeting and the upcoming summit 
are key opportunities to bring the public and private sectors together to discuss and debate solutions like these, and to finally build the modern, healthy, and green food systems that can support good nutrition for every person and every child in every country. So let's make it happen. Thank you so much, ED4. I wish you were here with us today, but we appreciate those remarks. I really appreciated that final remark, those, that bold vision that you put forward of good nutrition for every person and every child in every country. But I also really appreciate those practical measures that you spelled out for us, things like fortification of staple goods, clear and easy to understand food labeling, investment in public information and education for healthy diet, real practical steps that we can make. You've highlighted that hum a human right to food and health should be the core of food systems to address the triple burden of malnutrition through diversified diets and leaving no one behind. Really, thank you so much for sharing those words with us. Now, dear guest, we have an excellent panel for you. Um, so they're gonna be looking at food systems from a number of different angles, but always looking at how nutrition is at the heart of those that food system transformation we're looking to achieve. So you can please remember to use that question and answer function and we'll be collecting questions that we can share during that portion of our agenda today. Our first panelist today is His Excellency, Dr. Frank Anthony, Minister of Public Health of Guyana who will share with us his reflections on the, the building blocks for successful action to address malnutrition in all of his forms in his country. Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nancy. Excellencies, I am pleased to participate on behalf of the government of Guyana in this interactive session, putting nutrition at the center of food systems transformation. We agree that for food systems to be transformed, it requires collective effort to align from the international, regional, national, and subnational levels. In the Guyanese context, the right to food is enshrined in our constitution in Article 41, and it states, every person in Guyana is entitled to the basic right to be happy, creative, and a productive life, free from hunger, ignorance, and want. This article can be interpreted as the right to be free from hunger and malnutrition, to have physical and economic access at all times to adequate food in quality and quantity, that is nutritious and culturally acceptable or means for its procurement in a sustainable and dignified manner. Guided by these principles, we have focused on addressing poverty, hunger, agricultural production and trade in Guyana. Strategically, the government has looked at three key areas and that is uh, providing a comprehensive food security policy which includes strengthening family farming, combating poverty and extreme poverty, especially in rural areas. We have also looked at the non-traditional forms of agriculture so that the products that are not grown here that we can start growing them here in Guyana. We have also developed and implement strategies for climate smart interventions to mitigate against climate changes. These policies have significantly uh, reduced poverty, hunger, and destitution in our country. And in tackling the big three, malnutrition, lack of exercise, and chronic non-communicable diseases, for malnutrition, we have been able to use the national dietary guidelines uh, to comprehensively change the levels of malnutrition in Guyana. And if we look at children's undernourishment, we have been able to address this in several ways, looking at exclusive breastfeeding, appropriate complementary feeding practices, vitamin and mineral supplementation. And of course, in, in some of our schools, we have school feeding programs. 
Similarly, we have looked at overweight and obesity, and we have used several methods in terms of monitoring and educating uh, children on the use of food. We know, for example, that we have to reduce the consumption of high uh, saturated fats and trans fats, sugars and salts. And we have in collaboration with PAHO WHO introduced a program to educate uh, our people and also to practice this in all of our health facilities across the country. We have been teaching children in our school system how to counter the powerful techniques that companies use to promote unhealthy foods uh, to children. In terms of strategies to improve uh, physical well being, Guyana has embraced a lifelong approach to fitness. And while we are promoting sports at every level of the school system, we have also encouraged persons of all ages to be involved in sports and to remain fit and healthy. The government of Guyana believes that while these measures mentioned has undoubtedly helped to reduce malnutrition and non-communicable diseases and improve physical activity, sustaining these gains require that we make fundamental shifts in production of food, access and consumption. To do this, the government of Guyana has continuously invested in agriculture, expanding safety nets, social assistance program, and enhancing income generating activities for the rural and urban poor. For, poor, for the poor, as you know, agriculture production is both a source of food and a source of income. We are witnessing also the firsthand effects of climate change on our food system and its devastating impact on agriculture. And just recently, we had uh, devastating floods here in Guyana and in the neighboring countries of Suriname and Brazil. It has affected, uh, it has had direct effect on our food security, affecting availability, stability, access, and utilization. Countries need to urgently adopt climate smart agriculture policies to mitigate these impacts on the population. And to this end, our Ministry of Agriculture has been promoting a number of initiatives such as the Grow More Food, the Agriculture Export Diversification Program, and the Rural Enterprise Agricultural Development Program. This, we think, would help Guyana to be sustainable in food production and food security. This food summit presents many opportunities for us to put nutrition front and center of the developmental agenda. I expect that promoting cross-cutting policies to reduce in to reducing malnutrition, non-communicable diseases, and encouraging physical activities will be placed high on the global agenda. I firmly believe that there is a need for collective and coherent decision-making as it relates to marketing, front of package, warning, labels on food products, and of course, putting taxes on healthy foods. These interventions and other, other measures are about supporting people, sending the right signals, changing the economics of the system and getting commercial interests to shift focus and creating game-changing solutions for better food systems. I look forward to all countries being supported to create a comprehensive food and nutrition strategy, security strategy. A mechanism must also be found to help them with the technical and financial resources to enable this type of transformation. I look forward to the discussions and recommendations. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency. I am thrilled to hear that Guyana's constitution enshrines the right to food, but it was also just like ED4's uh, comments, I really appreciated your practical examples, your national dietary guidelines, your school feeding to get children to a good start, expanding social protection programs, and many more. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Our next distinguished panelist is uh, the UN resident coordinator in Nigeria, Mr. Edward Callan. Mr. Callan, it's a pleasure to have you here with us to share your experiences in what I'm sure is a tireless job of fostering collaboration among 19 resident and four non-resident entities of your UN country team in Nigeria. We appreciate your time today and we appreciate your unique perspective. 
Edward, sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy. Just doing a quick audio check. Do you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Your Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure for me to be here today representing the UN country team in Nigeria. The subject of nutrition is dear to my heart, as are the issues of engagement and empowerment. As the UN resident coordinator in the country, I value effective joint action that responds to government needs, and I'm the first to recognize that we can no longer work in isolation as we confront today's complex and interconnected problems. I welcome tools, strategies, platforms, and innovations that facilitate and spark collective action to ensure that the voice of stakeholders is reflected in policies and plans that catalyze equitable change, particularly the voice of the vulnerable communities. The United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework is one mechanism that we are leveraging in Nigeria to engage with a variety of stakeholders on food and nutrition security. The nutrition situation in Nigeria is challenging. Nigeria is an African powerhouse, yet Nigeria's high body of malnutrition is a cause for public health concerns. One out of every three children are stunted and one of every 10 children is wasted. As a result, close to 17 million Nigerian children under the age of five are undernourished, either stunted or wasted, giving Nigeria the highest body of stunted in Africa and the second highest in the world. Nigeria does not appear to be making progress towards the zero hunger goals. The percentage of people living under moderate or severe food insecurity has risen from 36.5% in 2015 to 44.4% in 2019. Currently, an estimated 12.8 million people in 16 Northern states and the Federal Capital Territory are critically food insecure and in need of humanitarian assistance. In addition to an increased risk of death, stunting is also linked to poor cognitive development decreased performance in education and low productivity in adulthood. These effects have impact on human capital and consequently economic losses estimated to account for as much as 11% of Nigerians gross domestic product. Additionally, over the past 20 years, Nigeria has witnessed only a five percentage point decline in the rate of stunting for children under the age of five. This clearly demonstrates that economic growth is not sufficient for addressing malnutrition and that there are other forces at play which need to be urgently addressed to accelerate the decline of all forms of malnutrition. Conflict and stark in 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 inequities, including gender disparities, are some of the main contributing factors. And of course, the COVID-19 crisis has just exacerbated the situation. The light at the end of the tunnel in Nigeria is the commitment at the highest level of the government to find solutions to the nutrition problems in the country at large. The UN country team in Nigeria is engaging strategically and is quite um, uh, positioned um, in the nutrition collaboration architecture. Three UN agencies, FAO, UNICEF, and WFP, teamed up with donors in Nigeria to form the Development Partners Group in 2011 when the country joined the scaling up nutrition movement. Over the past 10 years, the Development Partners Group has attempted to align priorities and interface with the government. The UN agencies have also supported the government to develop global action plan on child wasting, which commits to reducing stunting to less than 5% by 2025. In addition to supporting efforts at the national level, the Development Partners Group works to strengthen local nutrition governance and action. Community engagement and empowerment are crucial aspects of this and are necessary to make national policies work for the people. The Development Partners Group also collaborates closely with the Nigerian Governors Forum, a non-partisan platform to push nutrition scorecards as well as to incite peer learning among states. Instruments like the scorecard can enable monitoring and foster accountability. In this case, tracking government commitments 
and investing in nutrition. However, there are challenges. As of May 2021, while most of Nigerian 36 states have adopted the, food, the, the national food and nutrition policy and created budget lines for nutrition, the release and utilization of budgets, however, remains a challenge. Consequently, access to high impact nutrition intervention and nutritionally adequate diet remains a distant reality for most people. Therefore, not only do we need more money for nutrition, we also need to ensure more nutrition for the money that is being invested across different sectors, particularly agriculture, social protection, and health. I'm deeply disturbed to learn that only 10% of children in Nigeria consume a minimally acceptable diet. Urgent, equitable, climate smart action at all levels and across sectors is needed if we are to secure the nutrition and well being of the next generation of Nigerian children. I'm sure we all agree that nutrition is the foundation of individual good health and well being of prosperous, peaceful societies. At the UN in Nigeria, we are harmonizing our collective efforts and working with governments and communities at all levels to ensure nutrition security for Nigerians. Acting together, we can and must make this happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edward. Very powerful words to end with. We're so lucky to have benefited from your experiences and practical examples of that collective effort at the national level and how the UN country team is coming together with other partners in support to the needs of the country. And I also really appreciated that we need more money for nutrition and to ensure more nutrition for the money, a message I've heard before but I, I love those words and I can hear it again and I appreciate it coming from you, from your unique experience from Nigeria. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're truly honored to have with us as our next panelist, Dr. Shakuntala Silstead, who is not only the global lead of nutrition and public health at World Fish and the vice chair of Action Track 4 on advancing equitable livelihoods, but she is also the 2021 World Food Prize Laureate. We really couldn't find anyone with more knowledge on the role of aquatic food and transformation of food systems for healthy diets and are so pleased to have her here with us to share some of her wisdom. Dr. Tilstead, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nancy, and greetings to all from Rome, where in fact, I'm in the UN Nutrition Office together with my friend and colleague, Stine Karunima. I thank the UN Nutrition for giving me this opportunity to present. The UN Nutrition launched its first discussion paper on the role of aquatic foods in sustainable healthy diets in May this year. This discussion paper fill the gap of providing a global narrative on solutions and actions plans for diverse aquatic foods to combat global hunger and nutrition, further exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic last year and the continuing this year. This discussion paper explores the potential of diverse aquatic foods, such as seaweed and aquatic plants, mollusks, bivalves, and jellyfish, not just fish, and sourced from different aquatic environments, both marine and inland water bodies, to maximize the access and reach of these superfoods, especially for the poor and vulnerable. Several strategies primarily focused on the consumption of a diversity of nutritious, safe aquatic foods and products, as well as on nutrition sensitive production approaches and on supply chain actors are described in the nutrition paper. We know that about 3.3 billion people depend on aquatic foods for food and nutrition, and this number is growing, reaching more people in more geographies. Aquatic foods are nutritious powerhouses, providing multiple highly bioavailable micronutrients, minerals and vitamins, essential fatty acids and protein which are crucial for brain development and cognition and growth in infants and children and well-being in adults. Low traffic aquatic foods 
such as pelagic small fish are available and affordable to the poor. Dried small fish and products such as fish powder can be stored for a long period of time, providing nutritious food outside of the production season and in areas far away from water bodies. The inclusion of aquatic foods in national and subnational food-based dietary guidelines and in public driven programs such as social safety net, school feeding, mother and child health care, as we have heard from the Minister of Public Health in Guyana, are powerful pathways to nourish people, especially the poor and vulnerable. These strategies can also drive demand for aquatic foods and open and expand pathways for supply chain actors in aquatic food systems. In addition to the food and nutritional benefits, aquatic food systems are an important source of income and livelihoods for about 800 million people globally, mostly coastal and small scale actors in low and middle income countries. Almost half of these are women, and we estimate that this number is low as many women engaged in aquatic food systems are invisible. The UN Nutrition Discussion Paper presents evidence that women from aquatic food systems can be empowered to participate better in the systems and derive multiple benefits through capacity building and changing gender norms among both males and females at home and in communities. Bringing equity and social justice to women, youth and indigenous peoples in aquatic food systems is also highlighted in the discussion paper. UN member states and agencies are called upon to adopt the CFS's voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries to protect, build capacity and resilience of small-scale fishes in the face of disruptions and shocks, including climate change. In conclusion, for holistic transformation of food systems to take place, aquatic foods must be included. included. Diverse aquatic foods from diverse water bodies and just not a few fish species. In addition, all actors in aquatic food systems, including women, youth, and indigenous peoples, must be engaged as agents of change for finding the solutions that meet their needs and aspirations now and in the future. Thank you all. Thank you. The, those remarks are, are just really uh, full of your energy and, and your passion and your commitment. And, and I appreciate that so much. I also appreciate that when you're talking about aquatic foods, really having us think more broadly, thinking about, you said, think of things beyond fish and beyond that ocean aquatic environment, things that, that, that really put a different perspective on what we're talking about with, a, with aquatic foods. Um, I also really appreciate your linking this important discussion to inclusion, to youth inclusion, women's empowerment and indigenous peoples um, really and finally the reminding us about the tool that is the voluntary guidelines for food systems and nutrition just adopted by the CFS thank you so much for reminding us of that important tool as well and how it links to food systems transformation and the inclusion of aquatic foods as well so our final panelist I'm so excited to hear from it's Mr. Mike Kunga he is from Act for Good and the Vice Chair of the UN Food System Summit Action Track 5. And Mike, he's, he's roughly half my age, but he has an, an, an enviable repertoire of experiences and skills. He's a youth leader. He's been working with civil society. He's been working with the private sector and the government to address malnutrition in Malawi. So I'm, I'm very thrilled that he's been able to join us. I understand he has some connection troubles. I'm not sure if he's gonna be able to show his video, but we're anxious to hear your words. Mike, please, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Nancy. Just testing my video. I think 
um, Audi, I think I can be audible enough. We can hear you, yes. Thanks so much. So it is my pleasure, of course, to be part of this meeting. And I uh, apologize, I can't turn on my video because I'm traveling from Zambia to Malawi. And, uh, but actually, it's good uh, that I've listened a lot uh, from our keynote speakers. And a lot has been said uh, much to do with nutrition and food security as well as transforming our food systems. It was also my first time to learn the power of aquatic food. And maybe it would be now the focus of how probably we can move forward into boosting aquatic food uh, in our area, especially in small uh, islands and developing states. Uh, uh, in terms of nutrition and food system transformation from the side of the youth, it is quite noticeable that uh, the majority of the young people that are around in our cities or in our, in our countries, right now they've realized that the best way is to think of food and to think of our future. That is why the UN Food System Summit plays a very critical role in ensuring, in ensuring that young people are part of the summit. I am the vice chair and I know there are also vice chairs of UN Food System Summit and there are youth groups or youth constituencies on the Food System Summit that are working on transforming food systems and developing ideas from the youth perspective. Now, looking back from, from Action Track 5 perspective on the resilience part, uh, from the side of the youth, the focus much on the resilience is to ensure that how we can make some of the food, uh, some of the policies to be universal. For instance, uh, the school feeding uh, program or school feeding university, uh, initiative. If some of these policies can be made universal within the resilience perspective, then we should be able to uh, have safe and nutritious food in schools and even uh, in Nazareth where children who, who are most vulnerable can be able to access food. The last side is uh, we are currently working uh, much focusing on how we can boost the youth from the resilience uh, action track, especially in how they can connect various networks within their countries and within, within their region in order to transform food systems, more especially looking at the local production for local consumption. COVID-19, we have actually realized that uh, probably our market systems cannot guarantee food because of uh, travel restrictions and, and, and lockdown measures. So if you can boost this short supply chain in terms of the food systems, we should be able to ensure food resilience. So we are focusing much on the local production and local consumption in order to uh, perhaps uh, achieve food resilience. Mike, I'm not sure if you were finished because you broke out right there at the end. But we heard very, very well your perspective, we remembering the, the linkage right across now, the, the tracks. Great, Mike, can you try one more time? Come again. I'm afraid we're having trouble hearing. But I did appreciate your perspective of thinking about resilience and thinking about that linkage across those action tracks the way that we've been thinking about the Food Systems Summit, because of course food systems are hol holistic by definition. And though we've got these action tracks as a way to think through the issues and the solutions, it is all um, intertwined and interconnected. Thank you so much, Mike, for your words today. Um, I love to see the, the youth engaged in this summit, and I'm so pleased that you were able to join our panel today. So ladies and gentlemen, we have only about five minutes in order to uh, touch upon a few of the questions that have come up in our question and answer, um, but we will in do, indeed do that. And I think that the very first question is for His Excellency Frank Anthony. Excellency, there have been a couple of different questions around school feeding, and you touched on that in your remarks. So could you uh, give us a little bit of the context of how you were able to manage of sustaining full feeding programs in your country during the current COVID crisis? So we have a couple of programs because um, in Guyana, we have different regions and accessibility to them uh, varies. So in, in those bordering uh, communities, say with Brazil, um, one of the things that we've been able to do is to get the communities uh, to grow food. And then we, the government would buy that food or the education system would buy that food. We, uh, we employ people locally to cook it. And then we use that to feed the children. 
We work with the nutritionists in the Ministry of Health uh, to make sure that the menus are wholesome. And that's what we are using. And we have seen by using this methodology that not only are we providing income to these communities, but we are also uh, assisting uh, the children. And we have seen a decline uh, in the rates of stunting. Uh, in the city, after we have conducted uh, a special survey of nutritional needs among school age children, we found that they had particular uh, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And so we have been able to develop along with one of our companies locally, uh, biscuits that have, uh, that have been supplemented with vitamins. And so when we give this out to the kids, they're able to have a very uh, nutritious uh, biscuit that addresses uh, that particular form of deficiency. Uh, so there, there are many little things that we have been doing, and I think uh, it has worked because when we do the evaluation subsequently, we have seen a drop uh, in the prevalence of these particular um, uh, deficiencies. Thank you, Your Excellency. And, you know, I appreciate the fact that you've been doing a lot of measurement. That helps us see what works and what doesn't work and what might need to be adapted moving forward. So I really appreciate that you've been able to integrate that into your programming in your country. Um, another question now, um, there are actually a number of different questions coming in around Nigeria and some of the challenges related to humanitarian needs. So um, Mr. Edward, could I ask you to respond to this question? Could you speak of the humanitarian assistance required and how such assistance could be integrated into the Food System Summit in this summit from your perspective in uh, Nigeria? Mr. Edward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy. I think I start from the very basics. Whatever we do in ensuring nutrition is built around the principal pillar of leaving no one behind. The humanitarian situation is quite dear in, uh, in, in especially in Northeast Nigeria and now in Northwest Nigeria as we speak. We're talking roughly around 12.8 million people that need uh, humanitarian assistance. The critical element is that uh, we have to manage the needs during this lean season so that it does not deteriorate into a catastrophic food security situation that we have a major impact, especially nutritional impact on children and women, to be, uh, to be, to be brief. So um, uh, what we think is critical here is the, the efforts and mobilization at all levels to ensure that we provide adequate nutritious food to the affected population while they are income setting and also ensure that water sanitation and health facilities are also provided um, uh, to, to, to get the maximum benefit out of the nutritious food that is provided, especially for children. Fortified food becomes extremely critical in the areas of addressing and malnutrition. We requested for a billion dollars to be able to provide the humanitarian assistance to roughly 6.4 million people just in the northeastern part of the country. And now we have an additional 2.4 million people in the northwest of the country that needs urgent humanitarian needs. So this is indeed a challenge to us and that we need to mobilize all support to ensure that the situation does not deteriorate to a catastrophic level. That's what we are dealing with at this point in time. And nutrition is critical, access to food is critical, and uh, also in pockets of safe haven, giving um, uh, um, families uh, access to cultivate land, available land in safe areas becomes extremely important. Over Thank, you to so you. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing that perspective from Nigeria. Now in our last minute of our question and answer section, I'd like to turn one question over to Dr. Shakunsala. Um, there are a lot of questions coming your way, actually, but I'll give you just one and ask you if you could respond in one minute. What are some of the doable actions to ensure that we boost the short chain market supplies or the short food value chains? From your perspective, what are some doable actions that can help boost those short food value chains? Well, if you look at some of the systems that work um, in for short value chains, this is, for example, 
pond polyculture in rural areas where you can be producing large fish for the markets and small indigenous fish with high, with high micronutrient contents, which can be used by the families and in local markets. Also, if you will look at the large water bodies that you have, for example, the Great Lakes of Africa, we've done some work in Malawi, you can see that you that even though you want a short supply chain and you you can also make use of a long chain by processing the, the, the small fish from the lakes into dried fish, which, has, which can be moved for large differences, for large distances. And you have many poor and vulnerable communities in urban areas. So this is a very good way to move, to move the, the nutritious foods across long distances. I'll stop there, Nancy. Yes, thank you. Fantastic. That's such a practical response. And I know it was hard in such a short amount of time. Well, uh, ladies, gentlemen, I noticed that we have a lot of questions still in the question and answer, and we could continue this conversation much longer into the afternoon. But unfortunately, we don't have that luxury. But fortunately, we do have a very special guest here to help us wrap up our session. Please join me in welcoming Her Royal Highness Princess Sarah Zaid. Princess Sarah is a WFP Special Advisor for Mother and Child Nutrition and someone who I personally know is extremely passionate about all of us all working together for a brighter future and leaving no one behind. So please, Princess Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you very much to my fellow panelists for your very interesting and insightful interventions. Um, I, I am um, doom and gloom, I'm afraid. So, uh, so please take my, my comments uh, as motivation and, uh, and not as, as, um, as criticism. But I think it's very important that, uh, that we be very realistic about the world around us as we make some of the decisions and, uh, and we think through the, the future of food systems and, um, and nutrition. And the mere fact that we're having to have a session that is called putting nutrition at the center of food systems um, is a little bit disheartening because it means that it's not already there. Uh, you know, we all know that nutrition is the bedrock of all interventions and that without nutritional interventions without solid nutrition for all people that uh, all other interventions are not going to reach their potential uh, and uh, and that they we will we will see yet more waste um, both financial and human um, women and girls have to be at the heart of everything that is done because they are the key uh, they are the key because uh, in the first thousand days, uh, it is it is a, a woman that nurses a child exclusively for six months if they can. Uh, it is it is the mother who needs to be uh, healthy during a pregnancy in order to have healthy children. Um, women are often in charge of the household. Women are the farmers. They're in the marketplace. Um, they collect the water, they gather the firewood, they cook the school meals. And so if women and girls are not placed at the center of, of all thinking and everything that we do, then already we have, um, uh, we have again mitigated any of the benefits that we're going to see from any of this action. Um, it's very exciting to see how many people um, uh, are tuning in from all over the world and, uh, uh, you know, in, including countries with areas of the most uh, shocking food insecurity, South Sudan, Ethiopia, our colleague from Nigeria and, uh, and DRC. Um, Jan Egland uh, from NRC has something called the Kibu test. And uh, the Kibu test for him is that uh, if decisions that are made, if actions that are taken do not urgently translate into impact for the community in Kibu, uh, and I would add to that, if they are not easily um, understood 
and able to be implemented by practitioners, by officials, by humanitarians, uh, then, then we, have, we have yet again undermined any progress and uh, impact that we are aiming for. Um, and with regards to humanitarian settings, um, there are some, some real issues that also have to be addressed. Um, and uh, in ungoverned spaces, we have an access problem. Uh, we have an issue of lack of multi-sectoral action. Uh, you cannot have good nutrition without clean water. You cannot have good nutrition without access to healthcare. Uh, you cannot have good nutrition without access to education. Uh, and so all of this has to be done with nutrition transversally included in all thinking, in all planning, and in all implementation. And then the long-term aspect of this, as you know, humanitarian funding is short-term. Um, uh, you know, as an individual, uh, as, a, as a parent, as a, a sibling, as an auntie, um, how difficult it is for yourself to, um, you know what to do, but quite often it's quite hard uh, to do it. My own daughter definitely needs fortified rice. It's the one thing she eats. Um, and, uh, and as a mother, frankly, I've, I've given up trying to get anything else into her, despite everything that I know. Changing practices, changing minds, changing behaviors takes time. And too often in humanitarian settings, despite the fact that these crises can last for 30 years in DRC, um, uh, for, for 10 years in, in South Sudan and beyond, we do not have the time to change minds and behaviors to work with communities so that they understand the importance of this. Um, and, uh, and then my last point is to bear in mind how much we actually know. Uh, so we've just heard from our colleague in Nigeria about a very serious uh, lean season that is coming. Are we going to act? Are we going to do something about it? Uh, we know that in southern Madagascar, there is, um, there is in essence, uh, I don't think it has been officially declared a famine, but I think that it's, it's pretty close. Um, and this comes at, in an area where uh, it's very difficult to reach. Uh, it uh, is an area with some of the worst indicators um, and in the world. Um, and uh, they are currently in the, in the seventh year of drought, seven years. This isn't a surprise. How are the negotiations and the work that is happening today in this summit and then in September going to address the fact that we know so much, but we're not fully committed to actually doing something about it where it is most needed and changing the very systems that we have created uh, so that uh, we can see the proper impact that is needed in Kivu, for example. Um, you are uh, all extraordinary experts and practitioners. Um, it, uh, I, I, uh, the the multi-sectoral aspect of this um, though means that we have to also stop speaking to ourselves. If you understand nutrition, 100% you understand that it has to be, it is the bedrock of everything, has to be at the heart of everything. And, um, and at every opportunity, we have to be speaking to different communities. And, uh, and nutrition not just has to be at the heart of this summit, but has to be at the heart of, um, of, co of COP. In, uh, in Glasgow in a couple of, of um, months. And it has to be at the heart of all other discussions that take place. We can't just speak amongst ourselves. We have to speak amongst all sectors. Thank you very much indeed.
Thank you so much, Princess Sarah. I really couldn't have hoped for a better end to this excellent session. And, and you weren't doom and gloom, much to the contrary. Your words, really, you reminded us of our, of our challenge and, and I found them inspiring. I heard your call for action. Um, we can't forget the purpose of our food systems is to nourish us. We need to put people at the center, women and girls at the center. Um, we need to remember human rights have to be upheld at all times. We only have one planet and we're only one people. We need to end conflict in those inequities and we have to work together. We put nutrition at the heart of this food systems uh, transformation, but we have to be speaking to others. We have to be speaking to others. So thank you so much for those words. And ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, distinguished guests, friends and colleagues, we've come to the end of our session. But before you go, please allow me just one minute to thank everyone who made today possible. Our administrative staff and support, thank you. To the audiovisual technicians, thank you. To our Zoom gurus, thank you. And of course, to our chair, Dr. Nayoko, our keynote speaker, ED4, and all of our panelists, Excellency Frank and Anthony, Mr. Colon, Dr. Silstead, Mr. Mike, and Princess Sarah, thank you so much for your time today. So a recording of the session will soon be available through UN Nutrition on the landing page of the website. And if you wanna view it again or share it, it will all be available for you. Thank you everyone for your time today. I wish you a very fruitful continuation of this UN Food Systems Summit pre-summit. And I now end with a goodbye and a stay well.